take it at whatever speed you wish to go. So add it to me. Um, but what I'm trying to do is connect the very particular things we learned yesterday about the project in Haiti to larger enterprises. How does this connect to the next possible place and the next and the next? And how do we know what the next is? And a couple driving questions. Pass this around. It's not the left one. The right one. A couple driving questions are how we strengthen the weak ties, and I'll explain that, of communities that are in the throes of change. And how do we penetrate their grass ceilings and their grass floors? I'll explain that. So there is this common practice in international development that a lot of the decisions, a lot of the direction, a lot of the priority setting is done by people at the center of the major finance to international development. And they're in New York. They're in DC. They are the foundations. They are the elite universities. They are what I call, for shorthand, the transnational elite, the TNE, transnational elite. And they see each other every day. They have breakfast together. They conference together. They WebEx together. They, they put out an RFP for a new grant for $20 million. And before it's even launched, they know who's going to get the $20 million. But to keep it legal, the whole thing is made public. And the TNE in international development is a tight group that has crafted modernization theory of development for a long time. But strengthening the weak ties would be all of those outlying players in international development, uh, communities in Haiti, communities in Vietnam, where my wife and I worked for six years and a host of other places. So how do you connect Haiti to that community that's in the midst of change in Vietnam and connect it to Cambodia and connect it to 140 other countries and populations that are the weak ties? And then how do you connect the strong weak ties to the global north? Because that's an even weaker link that between the transnational elite and the people that are in the weak ties. So two endemic problems to international development is the grass ceiling and floor and the glass ceiling and floor. So in this really simple uh, diagram here, uh, the bottom of the pyramid would be really half the globe's population. And the grass ceiling and floor means basically this a very great deal of international development never penetrates down to the grass floor because it's been siphoned off by intermediaries before it gets to the grass. And those outstanding individuals with enormous potential at the bottom of the pyramid do not have the capability or the empowerment or the pathway or the introduction or the knowledge to pierce their grass ceiling to be a MOA, a middle out actor, who could be that important voice back and forth with international actors in and out of their context. That important voice with the bottom of the pyramid to the elite of their own setting. So that's one major obstacle is this grass ceiling, grass floor. The second is the glass ceiling, the glass floor. So let me change hats to the context where I spend a lot of my week, which is on a northern global north campus with middle class, upper middle class, upper class students. They suffer from a glass floor, a glass seat. The glass floor for them is they don't understand this context at all. 
They might watch YouTubes about it, they might read books about it in class, but if they're not seriously, relationally, directly engaged with people that are representing two-thirds of the globe, they too have a floor that is almost impenetrable for them to understand that other context. And they have a glass ceiling. Because even though they're global north, well-educated students from our campuses, they are not the TNE. They're not the transnational elite. So there's a ceiling above them, and there's a glass floor beneath them. They're encapsulated. This population is encapsulated. So the two driving questions for me are how do we strengthen the ties and the understanding of people who are not the elite, the weak ties? And how do we pierce grass and glass ceilings and floors? So I'm going to introduce some arguments about incubate, demonstrate, educate. And I'm going to introduce partners in just and sustainable development that are informing what IDE, incubate, demonstrate, educate, might be. I want to put those possibilities and those actors in the context of the leading development constructs that are out there. And that's modernization and dependency theory and postmodernism, market-based approaches, which is basically Sarana Haiti and Paul Pollock and Out of Poverty, but also community human-centric approaches, which go beyond the market-based approach. Then I want to drill down a little bit on what blended learning offers us today in 2012 with some tools to do this work that we didn't even have three, four, five years ago. We certainly didn't have 10 years ago. So the, the possibility is to really achieve this, and that's through blended learning, perhaps. And then just some definitions at the bottom that I'll keep referring to. The BOP is the bottom of the pyramid, a billion and a half families living on less than $2 a day per household. The middle of the curve is, in my North American context, that's the body that I'm trying to reach most often. It's neither the extreme of the left nor the extreme of the right. We've talked about the grass and glass ceilings. And then the last three things there are some of these very concrete educational projects underway that uh, might help us especially as we think of how do we scale up the possibilities of this kind of development that we've seen this run in Haiti, but we might see it in a number of other places. Uh, some of the pictures I'll have are from my neighborhood. I live in Denver, Colorado, in the Rockies in the United States. It's a beautiful area. And there is a historic, in fact, the, the oldest, the most historic part of our city is called Curtis Park, and it's also the poorest part of Denver. So it's been there the longest, but it's also been overlooked. And it is a place that uh, has a horse barn that the city of Denver owned, built in 1893, when the trolley system was drawn by horse, when the fire trucks were drawn by horse, when the police rode on horseback, and this was one of three or four municipal horse farms that they had in the 19th century. And lo and behold, it became a warehouse and it was never torn down. It never even had a floor put down. It's still a, a dirt floor from 1893. And the city is offering it to us as a home for 31 NGOs to cohabitate and collaborate and to do IDE, incubation, demonstration, education. So, uh, and the graffiti in this neighborhood is world-class art. Um, one of our, our team members has gone to the very important step of photographing all the art uh, before we fully renovate this place. So it's going to be painted over is what you're saying? No, the graffiti stays. Oh yeah? Um, because it's neighborhood graffiti. And this is, this is actually the horse barn. Mm -hmm. And we cannot change any of the brick front. 
We can't change any of the historic moving and storage language on the brick front from the 18, from the 1920s. Um, that's part of the, the, the law. But everything else about it will be a LEED certified state of the art construct. And it's gorgeous with um, thick beams and skylights that um, are just There's lots of character, lots of character. Tons of character. Okay. Tons of character. So how do we strengthen the weak ties with IDE, Incubate, Demonstrate, Educate, with some 21st century educational tools? And how do we build on the existing assets and relations that all of these NGOs have? How can we use these assets and relations and tools to create cohorts of students and think of them as student practitioners? They're not only learning, but they're also in the midst of practicing this development. And one of the options that we'll talk about with, with University of the World is to create cohorts of associates and master's degrees that are embedded in communities around the world. And their, their graduate or their associate work is in just and sustainable development. So let me explain what I mean by the three IDE terms. To incubate among, say, 30 NGOs at this structure, and this structure is two miles up the road in downtown from another structure, which is called the Alliance Center, and it has 36 NGOs in its building. It's another historic warehouse. So two miles apart, we have 67 NGOs headquartered in Denver. This group, the 36, work exclusively in Colorado on just and sustainable development, and the other 31 at the horse barn are global. This has existed for seven years, and this is still being rebuilt, so it doesn't open until next June. But we're all meeting monthly and starting the collaboration now. Um, so how could these two buildings, the Alliance Center and the Horse Barn, and two old warehouses from the 19th century, incubate? It would be a focus of testing our methods and articulating clearly for one another what our methods are. For instance, you know, what is this project's understanding of change? What is Sirona Hades' understanding of change? What happens when the electricity goes on? What does that lead to? And if you step back before the electricity, yesterday's diagram from Paul, what was the the idea and the belief behind the idea and the momentum behind the belief that got the first trailer in place. So we need to incubate and test whether we're urban or rural, whether we're Colorado or international, whether we're engineers or social scientists, why it is we're doing what we're doing, what's our starting point, that's one's ontology. Where do we start? How do we know what we know about doing just and sustainable change? That's our epistemology. How do we convey this to one another? How do we learn from one another? How do we make this patently understandable, not just among the people in this kind of room, but how do we make it understandable with the colleagues of another language, of another culture, of another part of this planet. I mean, how does a social scientist even make himself understood to engineers and vice versa? Right? So that's pedagogy. But if we're doing it with adult populations in very stressed areas who work full time as a farmer or as a laborer, it's not pedagogy at all. It's, it's something else that you and I and Henry as professors were never taught. Andragogy. How do we educate adults who work 40, 50, 60 hours a week? That's a different enterprise. And I would argue our starting point and our way of knowing and our way of learning and teaching one another 
informs our ethics. And it's a circular process. Our ethics then inform our ontology, our epistemology, our pedagogy. So how do we incubate and test ideas among ourselves and with all of our affiliates around the world? How do we then show the results, the best practices, the knowledge of that incubation? And can we carry out an educational project in real time with a shared understanding of what that ontology, epistemology, pedagogy, and ethics should be. And I'm going to proffer something radically different than what we learned on our campuses growing up. This is not how they do it at KSU, and this is not how they do it at Regis, or at Seattle, or at, I don't remember the name of the yeah, school. Where did that come from? <laughs> right. <I> mean, <laughs> Ontologically, I would argue for us to do international and just and sustainable development well, our starting point is relationships. Not our discipline. So it's not that I'm an engineer and I start with the starting and entry point of what an engineer must know, or what a social scientist, or what an economist, or what a nurse, or what an agronomist, or what a hydrologist, or what a something is must know but we start with relations and our epistemology our way of knowing is not what each of our disciplines has narrowly taught us on how to construct our science but our epistemology is grounded in fear and love and the pedagogy the way of learning is in community community is the basis. The community is the primary informant and questioner and vetter of whether we know what the heck we're doing. And then this leads to an ethic, I would argue, of reciprocity. So it's not the North telling the South. It's not IEEE telling PES, telling CSI, telling the world. But it's a reciprocal arrangement that is a two-way conveyor belt of knowledge and wisdom and experience and questions that grows into trust, that grows into human capabilities, that ultimately, if you do these three things well, is empowerment. So again, why does Sorona Haiti do what it does? What's its starting point? What's its way of knowing? How is it learning and how is it conveying knowledge? And what's its ethic? Another word for ethic is so what? What's the so what here? Is the so what to grow the sun blazers to the size of HVT? No, <laughs> I think not. But we have to answer the so what, always. Stop me at any point, please, if you've got questions or better ideas. Yes? Uh, so far, you, I know you're just framing questions here, but um, you talked only kind of about an adult situation, but in fact, I presume you mean to talk about the whole spectrum of education. Right. I would say we have a communities with K through 12, kindergarten through 12th graders. We've got this narrow window of college students. We've got a narrow window of grad students. We have post-grads who are professionals and people of service and civic organization, we have leaders. In the midst of community, one of the options that I'm going to talk about here, the basis of their learning is the family unit, but it could also be any other grouping in community. 
And you know, that spectrum exists in North America, in the global north, it exists in Africa, it exists in the global south. Uh, we would have slightly different labels, but I would like to imagine that if this is done well, five-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 15-year-olds in preparation for college are thinking the questions of just and sustainable development. And they might actually be thinking ahead, how can I choose that as my, my path in life? How can I do that as a job? How can I say I want that to be my vocation? And then they carry this further in college and graduate school and begin a profession they begin a vocation of just and sustainable development, which comes out of community, telling them this is something you should do. And it serves community. I mean, this is not far-fetched. When we think of the training that somebody goes through, and when they start that thinking and training to be a nurse or a doctor, it starts here. It doesn't start after 10 years of practicing as a lawyer or a paralegal and then saying, I'd like to begin. No, a nurse or a doctor begins that thought process here. And community, and state, and society, and tax dollars, and the media support that idea that that's a great way to spend your life. So when I go to the hospital, and I show my Kaiser card, I don't care who it is in the Kaiser building. I'm assured that I'm going to get good care because they have been vetted all the way along. And in development, I've got absolutely no guarantee that the person in development knows anything about development because there is no vetting process. There is no process. It's kind of silly because development is way more complex than being a nurse or a doctor or being a lawyer or being an engineer. It is way more complex because there are so many variables, so many actors, so many entry points contending ontologies, epistemologies, and pedagogies. So all the more reason to figure out how IDE becomes something that is exciting for a kindergartner and they see at that horse barn, an example of somebody doing water well for the sake of people, or energy well for the sake of people. And that gets reinforced when they're 10 years old, and they go to the horse barn again, and it's reinforced when they're 15 years old in a high school class, and it's reinforced at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And that's not to say that everybody who does sustainable development work has to be on this track. But right now, our societies, our professions, our states are not preparing people for this kind of service, whether it's South Africa, Haiti, or the United States. So I'm going to talk about the different audiences that these groups are meaning to speak to. So I'll leave that there and remind me when we get to this and I've got to connect it back to that. But how far and how broken are we? You know, these glass and grass ceilings and floors. Uh, this comes from Pollock. The design and the development of things on Earth, 90% of our R&D is in service of 10% of the population. It's to be sold to the 10% of us who can pay top dollar for that R&D. So why that and not D90, which is turning it upside down and saying that our research and design, our work on the university should be not for the 10%, but for the 90%. Another blockage for us getting to that kind of picture is this. Right now, the traditional way in which we're taught on campuses is that the professor shares knowledge and the students follow in the path of the professor. 
And evaluation and assessment is based on the extent to which a student captures the, the idea and the knowledge of the professor. Well, those professors don't even talk to other professors who are in a different discipline or in a different building. And you look at this Wits University, how spread out it is. I mean, it is so spread out. I'm quite certain that many buildings on this campus can't even tell you where the other buildings are on this campus. But it's the same in the United States. We live in academe silos. But an alternative to it is the University of the World, which I'll talk about, which turns that upside down. It says the primary educators are not the professors, but the communities and the people in the communities who define that. We'll talk about that. Another part of the broken relations is nailed beautifully by Robert Chambers, um, who's written two seminal books on rural poverty and rural development with subtitles, the first shall be last. And the other one is the last shall be first. But what he's pointing out is the enormous gap between urban and rural knowledge, urban and rural investment. My wife and I spent six years in Vietnam. For every one dollar invested in the Mekong Delta in the rural part of the country, which is the breadbasket for the whole people, twelve dollars was spent in Hanoi. 12 to 1 ratio, urban to rural, and that's a global trend. There's this enormous gap between the, what the scholars know in their academic silos and what the practitioners know. And the scholars take it slow and test things meticulously, and the scholars work on six month, 12 month time frames and funding cycles. I mean, these are different planets, but they have to, they have to be talking to each other. Professionals and farmers, scarcely talk to each other. My colleagues over in uh, Mozambique introduced me to this term from Portuguese colonialism, alphabetism. So the gap of those who are colonizers and those who are colonized. The Portuguese taught the Mozambicans A, B, C, D, the alphabet in Portuguese, to be functionaries, to be tools in the Portuguese colony and their economic system. They were not taught E, F, G, H in Portuguese, the rest of the alphabet. They were not taught fluency. They were not taught to write their own literature. Because once you know your own literature and you write your own literature, uh, you're no longer somebody else's functionary. So the alternative to that is a pluralism which closes the gap between the knowledge of the city and the countryside, the scholar, the practitioner, the professional, the farmer, the colonizer, the colonized. And then we've got just this heavy, thick overlay of modernist theories of how we do develop. Um, and there are many of them. And we're not going to go through all of them this morning, but I mean, this needs to be well understood by different populations, how heavy the influence of modernist theory is on how we choose to do development. Whether it's capitalist or socialist, whether it's out of Washington or Marxist, these are very heavy constructs on how we do development theory, which is different than ABCD, asset based community development, or PRA, participatory rural appraisal, or Pollock, and a lot of, I think, the underlying theory for this project with Sharona Hadia's local supply and value chains. These are very different approaches to development. And then there is always the political and cultural clash. And this is profound. So some examples, the six years that we lived in Vietnam were really seminal years. We had the first visas for North Americans to reside in Vietnam after their six wars in a row. And when we first moved to the country, in those first six months, there were four expatriates living in the country. Four, about a 68 million. 
It was phenomenal. And it was a little bit of a fishbowl. And toward the end of our stay, I was part of talks between Robert McNamara, the former Secretary of Defense and head of the Pentagon for the United States, and a primary person who brought war to Vietnam, the American War. And his counterpart, General Tack, their Secretary of Defense, both very, very old men in their late 80s. Soon after this conference, Tack died of cancer, and a couple of years later, McNamara died. But it came out of McNamara's, this, this conference was paid for by the Rockefeller Foundation. It was hosted by Brown University. And the deal was that the conference would refurbish an old colonial hotel, which Vietnam needed refurbished so that businessmen could have a nice place to stay. It's one of the first things that money is spent on in international development is the hotels. For the first five years of Western money coming back into Vietnam, it went into hotels. It went into car factories. It went into the port. It wasn't a 12 to 1 ratio city to countryside. It was like 120 to 1 ratio of where the investment went. So this conference produced a refurbished hotel. Uh, but it came out of McNamara's book, in retrospect, where he wanted to examine mistakes made by both the Vietnamese and the Americans in the disconnect in that war, but also a disconnect in how they saw development in the future. There's a total disconnect. And the Vietnamese were also asking questions about Doi Moi, which was their renovation process. So it made sense to have the conference. And McNamara, Robert Strange McNamara said, we need not repeat a century of needless loss. The 20th century was a century of loss. An enormous death wrought by lousy development projects and lousy skills. And most of the loss was not interstate war. Most of the carnage of the 20th century was states doing things badly with their own people. Bad development, bad statehood. So we don't have to repeat this. So let's learn from one another. And that was the premise. And it immediately became a conflict because McNamara wanted to frame and seat the participants in such a way from his angle. And the Vietnamese come from a totally different angle. So days were spent before the conference, figuring out the seating arrangement around the table for 26 people. And then, are we talking the seven years that Robert McNamara was Secretary of Defense, or are we talking the 4,000 years that the Vietnamese talk about their development? They've been developing as a people and a culture for four millennia, not for the seven years that the Americans fought in Vietnam. And are we talking? Western capitalist modernist ideology, or are we talking socialist republic, or are we talking Southeast Asian communities, communalism? Three completely different political ideologies. And it was very much about power. So to try to close these gaps, I'm giving this example because it's just enormously complex to close these gaps. And in the end, you know, after several days of conferring, uh, I mean, we were talking about a lot of difficult stuff. And the Vietnamese were told by Robert McNamara, it was nothing personal that the United States fought you. But you fit into our Cold War construct of the world. And we had nothing personally against the Vietnamese, but you fit in this unfortunate place in our construct of the world. And the Vietnamese nearly walked out of the room when they heard that it was not personal that they lost nearly 4 million people. Um, and McNamara then stood up and said, if we had understood you better, we needed to understand you better. And then there wouldn't have been 4 million deaths. And Professor Herring from Kentucky said, but Secretary McNamara, you fired everybody at the Pentagon who was a Southeast Asian expert or could speak those languages. It wasn't in the mentality of U.S. development. It wasn't in the mentality of modernism. It wasn't the mentality of our military to try to know the other. This goes back to here. I mean, 
the U.S. starting point in development and politics and war was we are number one. And development followed from that. And war followed from that. And McNamara almost yelled at them. He always would thump with his left fist on the podium that you had a duty to tell us who you were and to be more transparent, just like Haitians need to let North Americans know who they are and what they need, right? And the Vietnamese argue was our only defense was the fact that we could be quiet. And then he asked them, how much attrition were you willing to sustain? And there was no response. But the answer is, there was no limit. And then finally, I show this picture of the street behind the hotel. It's not a very wide street, it's from here to there. And after the conference, McNamara was trying to cross from this curb to that curb. But because of the motorbikes and the bicycles and the oil tins coming down the road, and there being no stoplights and no stop signs and no street lights because of the US embargo still, he couldn't cross this street from here to there. And he was muttering, this place makes no goddamn sense. Okay, I take that as an analogy to development, not just McNamara in Vietnam, but how many development personnel mutter this place, whatever that place is, makes no goddamn sense. At least it doesn't make sense the way I make sense. Which is silly. Because the Vietnamese construct was we've survived 4,000 years and we've held off the French twice. Chinese 11 times, the Japanese, the Soviets, the Americans, the British. We've got a logic. We know how to develop. Just let's work together. Uh, kind of a question, I guess. Um, what you're describing here are almost, to me, symptoms. You know, these are what we are like. <clears throat> but. And, and they're true. And everything, everything you've said, we've, we've experienced, we've lived through, and again, it's all right money. Um, but how, you know, in terms of how did we get here? Because I think if we're like, we need to, I come, as a lawyer, you know this as well as I do, you live in practice silos, which are just as the same as everything else. Um, development silos or engineering silos or academic silos. And lawyers would be like, well, it'd be really good if we could cross market we could just leverage our skills and go to clients and attract them. And you're like, great in principle, but nobody could really, you could bridge those gaps, break down the silos for very short periods of time. But the entrenched uh, value system forced the silos to be recreated because I wanted my practice and I was compensated based on my clientele, my billable hours, and so were you. And so we might cross market to get Shell but as soon as that work came in, we were siloed again to protect our own vested interests. And all these things, the symptoms don't exist because we intentionally did them. It's because somehow there's something built in that this is what protects me, this is in my best interest. How do you address that? There's an underlying value system to this starting point. And you and I were talking about this two days ago. The starting point for law firms today is billable hours and profit. Uh, many universities, though they are nonprofits, it's it's a money enterprise. Um, you know, this is part of the value system that there are some who know how to direct the planet, and there are others who will follow. There's a value system behind the fact that we've got a bottom of the pyramid that has a grass ceiling and floor. So. That's a beautiful question. What's the underlying value system? I think this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. And that value system on how we should live better reinforms that ontology, and it's a cycle. So, I mean, this is a fundamental question about doing development well. What is the value system of how I'm learning to do this well and carrying it out? Is it profit? And a lot of development is pure and simply profit. Is it love? Historically, a lot of development has been about love. The mission movement, volunteerism, NGOs, some, not all, started in that vein. But in order to stay afloat, they've kind of taken on the corporate model. 
I mean, CARE International started with the provision of little CARE packets, but it's a $2 billion a year enterprise now, which doesn't mean there still can't be CARE and love in their value system, but one must ask, is that your value system? Or is it profit in the industry of the international development? Because they're trying to secure the same billion dollar contract that World Vision would like and Save the Children would like, and IRC would like. So what is that underlying value system? And I think at this early stage, Ray, of where this project is imagining where to go, that's a good question to ask. Why is PES and CSI, and why are the individuals that tap into the Monday morning webinars of Ray <coughs> Why are they? What's the value behind? <clears throat> the French value system was twofold. It was to create a Paris of the East and to propagate French values in the Orient. And Hanoi was to be the heart of it. And they brought Eiffel, who had already proven himself with his power, as the preeminent architect of the world to Hanoi to construct the municipal buildings and the churches. He brought his whole team of architects and artists to create Paris of the East. But were any of the farmer's children in Vietnam invited out of the rice paddy or the rubber plantation or the slave yards to speak about any of this construct of their life? So out of the French period came this wonderful proverb, to steal from the French is not to steal. And you hear it. And they insert things today, to steal from World Vision is not to steal. <laughs> to steal from the United Nations is not to steal. It's okay. If they are so much about pitching their construct and their power, whether it's through the schools or the religion or the language or the politics, or they are so much about their imperialism, their social engineering, their alphabetism, that they ignore Vietnam's own everyday politics, everyday strategies for surviving, and for loving, and for living well, then pick their pocket and send them home. But don't send them home until you have very thoroughly picked their pocket. Because to steal from the French is not the same as stealing. Vietnamese are pretty passionate we're proud about that. That concept, though, is not unique to the Vietnamese. Of course not. This, I mean, because of course not. thousands and thousands of years, you know, the very beginning of time, right. there are there's religious writings. There are, you know, yeah. it's like to steal from certain people. It's not stealing. Yep, yeah. that's right. How do you tackle that issue if it's so core in human flawlessness that it goes back to prehistoric time? <laughs> if an intruder has this value system, and my culture and my family and my village live by this value system, and they don't speak my language, they don't even ask me about anything we know, whether it's Vietnam or Haiti or anywhere, pick their pocket clean. I mean, I would probably do the same in my own culture if somebody treated me with such disdain. Dennis Dutre was head of the IMF for East Asia and Southeast Asia, and he was the country director for Indonesia in 1997 when the currency crisis ruined the, crisis, uh, the, the currencies and the economies of East Asia. And he, he quit. But at the luncheon, on the day before he quit, he called his staff together and he said, you know, it would have done me well, it would have done all of us well on our flight here to Indonesia if we had read a book about Indonesia before we arrived. Amen. So these are four people that I always refer people to when they come to Vietnam. Read correctly, talk to Lady Horton, talk to Louise Bueller, see if you can get an audience with Walton Swan. Listen to what the people who have lived here forever know before you start your development project on someone else's behalf. Marta Sen, Nobel laureate in economics, 
you know, gets the Nobel Prize for pressing this very point that I've been talking about. He's not trying to convert necessarily the people in this room, but he's trying to convert the people of the transnational elite who drive international development, and they drive it from an entry point of economics. How do we grow the gross national product of a country? How do we stabilize their currency? How do we make Haiti fit within 193 other countries so that it doesn't rock the boat? That's the agenda of the TNE. And Sen says, let me pose to you a parable before you run down the track of trying to change Haiti's economy. And his parable, very, very simply, and this is, he's, he's from Dhaka, he's a Bengali, but he's taught at Harvard and Cambridge, lives at Cambridge now. Um, but those are the streets. You know, a third of the men in Dhaka are employed in one way or another by rickshaw. They are either the rickshaw peddler or the person repairing the rickshaw. They're beautiful, they're works of art. So they're the artists who paint the rickshaw. They pump the tires, they replace the tires. A third of the men of Dhaka work in rickshaws. And I take my students to, to Dhaka to study development in Bangladesh. And the first thing I point out to them once they're caught in traffic is that the population density of Dhaka is 47 times more dense than the population of Denver. So whatever ideas you had in Denver about how to do development, so what? <laughs> Welcome to DACA. And think it over. Think it afresh. Walk through those steps. Um, here's one of the rich young men. But his parable goes something like this, and this is fun. I was introducing this parable to students at University of Colorado with Engineers Without Borders. And the first question was, do you know, do you all know what a parable is? And this reminded me of the disconnect between my discipline and their discipline. And they gave me definition for par parabolic and a parabola. <laughs> no, we're not talking parabolas. <laughs> but, but let's be clear what a parable is. These were engineers. <laughs> they were engineers. Engineers without borders. But wonderful, wonderful young people. Engineers without parables. That's right. So, Martin, what is a parable? How does a parable work? I don't know. I'm just a physicist. You're not just a physicist. <laughs> what is a parable? How does a parable work? It's a story. Okay, it's a story. What else is a parable? A lesson. A lesson. There's a lesson to that story. So is it like an allegory? Is it like a fable? Is it like a moral? It could be a picture. I mean, how is the lesson in a parable taught? How does the lesson in a parable get across? By, by contrast. By contrast. So what are you contrasting? So by analogy. Put it in context. Okay, there's context, there's analogy, there's contrast. There's more. I mean, how is it different from, say, a fable? When my kids were younger, I would read them fables. I would read them fairy tales. I would read them a story. The stories would have little lessons, they would have little morals, and then hopefully they would go to sleep. But, you know, most fairy tales are pretty scary, so you don't want to read too many of them. But what's, what's the difference between those simple stories with lessons and a parable? I think parables tend to be more realistic. They tend to be constructed to, to, uh, to maybe in fantasy land like fables, but they tend to be more concrete, more realistic. Take 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 the parable of the, some of the parables of Chinese scripture. Those were stories that uh, the people didn't have difficulty imagining because they could they were situated in real places. They could relate to it. They could relate to it. Most um, most parables confront a dilemma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the person has to choose mm -hmm. one way or the other. Right. And then it gets to this contrast of choose this or choose that. Mm -hmm. And what are you comparing? Good and evil, right and wrong. Okay. All right, some pretty major ethical questions. So it's not a little story with a little lesson. These are big, big lessons, but it's not patently clear what the answer is. 
Parables have no ending. They never have a period at the end. And the comparison is how Noel would hear and respond to it compared to how Ray would hear and respond to it and Martin and everyone else in the room. So imagine the room filled with people from all different countries and cultures and languages and political and religious systems. If we approached development not with parabolas but with parables and carried on that kind of listening comparative process, you begin to get to where Amartasen is asking us to begin in our relationships and our starting point with that ontology. So he offers this simple parable. Annapurna wants someone to clear up her garden. The garden has suffered from neglect. And surrounding her estate, there are three unemployed laborers, Dino Mushano Regini, all very much want the job to clean her garden. And she can only offer the job to one person. It's indivisible work. One person gets it, not all three. And it's a day's labor. Dino is the poorest of the three. Should Dino get the job? Bushano has recently been impoverished and is psychologically the most depressed. Should Bushano get the job? Regini is debilitated from a chronic ailment, but she has learned as a woman culture stoically to absorb the shock and the little bit. Should she get the job? Say. what now this system brings to this pattern of practice, right? Say, Just clean it up the garden. As a lawyer, I don't have enough information. Yeah, well, right. That's all I need for more. The business person goes, <laughs> not enough data. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which information that you're using and how you evaluate that information, yeah. which can yeah. differ from person to person. Okay, don't don't think that I'm Dan here. I think I'm on a perna. Give me something I need. Help me. Who's gonna do the best job? Who's gonna come back from for more work when you have the next one? Who's gonna take what you do and you give them a job and take it and spread it? Those would be the, those would be my if I talk down it I'd say that's the decision that I'll, that's how to make the decision. But what do they have family that they're supporting in different family? Do some of them have kids? Yeah, let's assume they are all of the surrounding shanty town, surrounding her tea plantation. I can picture Annapurna in the Anam part of India, just above Bangladesh. So you've got these families very destitute of poverty. But do we help the poorest? Do we help the psychologically impoverished? Do we help the chronically ailing and debilitated person? Would you help someone that has more positive influence in society? I, I help someone that helps me. All right. So if I help this one, is it going to have a broader effect? You were asking, depending on who I choose, is it going to have a longer lasting effect that I can trust and go back to this person? What else? Well, it's okay. There's a dichotomy here between the selfish interests of Anna Prana and wanting to get her garden cleared, or the humanitarian interests in looking deeper into the situation of the potential laborers and saying, okay, I'm going to extend my my graciousness and bless this job on this own. The business person is looking at, okay, who's going to do the best job at cleaning up my garden? I don't care about what their situation is. I want someone to come and do it in three hours. I'm going to pay them this much money to do it. Great. Is my garden tilled? Is the seeds planted? Here we go. You know, who's going to show up on time? You know, who's going to give me the most pleasant interaction with me, regardless of what their dilemma is? You know, who's going to be more efficient? You know, or the humanitarian side is, oh gosh, how can I think of the warm and caring, nurturing thing, and what should I do for this person out here? You know, which is all very fine. You know, but that latter one is not sustainable. Because even though you're like, oh, I've got a heart and I want to help this person, your self-interest, right. which is ubiquitous, extending back centuries, right? Prehistoric, your self-interest drives this That's stuff. Right. So the question is, how do you align? It's not 
I don't think you can change your value system, but Inu, Bashunu, and Rogini can come to you and say, no, if you help me, I will help you in a greater way. And right. you will see rewards because you know, Dino is the poorest of the three, I, but I live beside you, and if you give me this job, not only will, will you have a clean garden, but my house, will, I will also have money to fix my front window, which has been broken for five years. Which you've been complaining about. Right, and, that's, <laughs> and it's, it becomes an alignment of our, all our own self-interests become aligned. But it's, you know, I don't know. It's not important. <laughs> but it also depends on the environment. So if those three people, if they, within their own uh, decision set, know that one of them should get it, and all the other ones would be jealous, if you choose the other ones, and your you know long-term interests could be, you know, business interests could also be in jeopardy. Uh, absolutely, but that actually goes back to my point. Actually, which one of these three? I might. It might be better off to give, you know. Bashano the job because actually I happen to know Bashano and she's actually really mean. If I don't give her the job, I give the job to Dino, she's gonna go mug Dino for the money. I'm actually like, you know, maybe I'm better off, you know, just breaking stuff up. I mean, but it becomes I'm looking at my own self-interest. Why do we say better off? Depends yeah. on what we want. Right. That's and so that's, that's what that's why I think Mike's point was to he called it a dichotomy, and I was saying depending on the value system. What does Anapuna, what does she want? What does she want out of clearing this garden? And that's something that I don't think we know. It's not Anapura. My point is actually, Mike's point is unavoidable. You know, the, the silos exist because of self-interest. These values, it's okay to pick somebody's pocket, it exists because of something fundamentally broken in humanity that stems back to the dawn of time. The, so how do you, you've got, you've got to do this work, this development work, this humanitarian work and make us all better without, with acknowledging a fundamental brokenness and how do you do that? And What's the fundamental brokenness? That is that selfishness, it's that self-motivation, the need to feed my family, the need to care for, you know, Okay. This is welcome power for you. Yeah. I mean, to the economists, the fundamental brokenness is the economy, stupid. To the humanitarian, the fundamental brokenness are the relationships. I shared this with a class of graduate students two months ago. They were all from a graduate school of professional psychology. All of them were going to give the job to Bishano. Why? Because of their ontology. Yeah. If they're a hammer, everything's a nail. Right? I mean, this is an age old parable. And what Sen gets the Nobel Prize for is that he has provoked a good dialogue that there isn't an answer to this parable. There isn't. Yeah. There isn't. Keep working at it, keep discussing it. Know that different entry points do different things and figure out, this is the next part of his thesis, figure out a way amongst all of you to do all of it, always. Don't privilege one entry point over the others. So we've got an entry point. We've got a business model with a Sun Blazer solar trailer and a service, but as that is perfected, don't forget, and don't discount, and don't disparage a whole bunch of other entry points. Which isn't to say this project does all the entry points, not at all. But this project must be wisened to this process of learning in the same way we want kids to be healthy or prepare analytically. We want people to think holistically about what's going on. If you remember the parables of Jesus, who was it who never, ever understood the parables? <laughs> the disciples, the ones closest to Jesus, closest to the epicenter of what's going on. Because why? Why did they never get it? 
What did they always demand, and why did they never get it? The right answer. They always wanted the right answer. Tell us the answer. There isn't one. They never got it because they were always asking the wrong question and had the wrong expectation. So Sen says, fundamentally, we're talking about a process here. We're growing simultaneously, development and freedom, and shall we break in five minutes, say, yeah. for more food and more drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. There's a parable behind that, too. <laughs> How much food and drink do you need? How much do you have? So let me get through Sen, because this sets up a good stage. And, and this is, this is the, the pink palace in Dhaka. Have any of you been to Dhaka? to enjoy 47 times the density of human population. <laughs> I think of that every time I'm caught in a traffic jam in Denver. What would this be like 47 times worse? <laughs> and this isn't a country, Bangladesh, which Henry Kissinger famously called the basket case of the world. It's not worth one dollar of development a day. Because you know, other than this section here alongside Burma, this is called the uplands, most of Bangladesh in its entirety is no more than one meter above sea level. And a very large portion of Bangladesh, including much of Dhaka, is below sea level. And global warming is going to turn this into beautiful seaside resort for those people that are a meter and above sea level. <laughs> Um, but his argument out of this context, growing up in the shadow of the Pink Palace, which was owned by the Mughals, and the Mughals then gave way to the Indian Raj, and the Indian Raj gave way to the Pakistani uh, genocide, and the genocide gave way to the cyclones and the droughts and the famine. And out of that history, this country, which is below sea level, comes up with some of the best literature and arguments and concepts and pictures of how to do development in a sustainable way. The last shall be first. That's also where Chambers did a lot of his work. But this is a process. Development and freedom are in tandem. And freedom is both the end and the means. Okay, that should make sense. He's coming out of East Bengal. This is Gandhi. The ends are the means, the means are the end, the two are never separable. So the end of development is that people have a deep, inviting, intrinsic, a lasting, a never ending. Their identity, their constitutive identity is to be free. That's what people want out of development. Why do they want this solar trailer? It's not necessarily to charge the cell phone. They want the freedom to charge the cell phone. They don't want the unfreedom to not be able to be connected. They don't want the unfreedom of being cut off. But the means of reaching the end, the process, are these five instrumental freedoms. And these five instrumental freedoms, this is my, my Sen Pentagon, always ever move forward at the same time together. This is Sen's argument. Again, this is Nobel laureate kind of thinking. Political freedom has to move forward at the same time that people have economic roles, has to move forward at the same time that people have social opportunities, has to move forward at the same time there is transparency, people have access to information, has to move forward at the same time that they are secure from natural disaster and political disaster and human rights abuse. And Sen says, these won't all be equal always, but you have to consciously move forward in your development thinking of all five always. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, when he was in his 90s, but still sitting on the Supreme Court in the US, famously wrote, I don't give a fig for simplicity this side of complexity, but I'll give my life for simplicity on the far side of complexity. 
Here's the complexity. Here's the simplicity. So this goes, Paul, back to the question, what's the underlying value in doing the work that we do? For sin, he's saying it's freedom. But I think each of us have to wrestle with the answer to the question, what is the underlying value? Is it love? Is it freedom? Is it pure science? Is it profit? Survival. Is it survival? Ours, theirs, mine? This is the complexity. We don't get to this simplicity but by passing through the forest, or the floods, or the cyclones, or the earthquakes, or the civil wars, or the three and a half million dead Vietnamese. Should I pause? Yes, it was a challenge on this. Okay. Freedom is chaos. When you are free to do, you know, people, you know, if you have true, total political freedom, true democracy, it's devolved into mob rule. Economics, social opportunities, transparency, protective freedoms, these things all exist at the top of the pyramid. We are free. We have every single one of those, and we have those largely because we have oppressed the snot of the people at the bottom. The surrendering, giving the giving up my oppression at the bottom has a, places all of my freedoms at risk. How do you? Sen's response. You're taking an issue with Sen. This isn't my argument. Right. What Sen's argument is that. The TNE, the Transnational League, has done these two things principally. Missionaries did this principally. Militaries do this principally. And the mass media does this principally. From each of their ontologies, each of their starting points, they privilege this and run with it all the way down the track, forgetting the other four. And it fails. And then he goes into great empirical depth showing from the global south and the global north. When you go down this track and ignore these four things, it's failure. When you go down this track and ignore the other four things, it's failure. This without the other four, it's failure. This without the other four, failure. This without the other four, failure. His argument is find a process that respects the beginning and the ending point as a process, that's all five. But it's only failure at a macro level. At the micro level, at the individual level, it's incredible success. Now let me share with you an experience that I've had in my own uh, journey here. Uh, within the Toshbara Foundation, we have, we've, we've talked about 13 different partners uh, that address these. And over the years, I have, I have had that challenge justifying to my board of directors why we cannot just do one of those. The board is asking you yes. to do one. And I'm saying we don't have the option of doing just one of those because every one of them in isolation to the others guarantees failure. In fact, it is, it is partly the problem that we have in this transnational elite mind. We, we think we can take one thing, do it well, and it works well in the West. But the only reason it works well in the West is because somebody else has taken care of the other things. I, I totally agree with you. It works yeah. incredibly well in every country. Go to Haiti, go to um, Vietnam, go to any country in the world, no matter how impoverished or how rich, there is a group of elite that have mastered all five within their personal realm. And they're doing fantastic. And they've oppressed the smile out of everybody else. But how do you break that? But that's my desire as a human being that goes back centuries, decades, centuries, millennia. How do you break that? How do you? make it so that I don't just care about centering my personal freedoms, but I care about yours. I think we'll, I think we'll measure that in a second.
good question. Okay, go. Thank you. Let's take a break.